And welcome to the Obelisk. Tonight's guest is Ben Davidson from the Suspicious Observers channel. This is a show we pre recorded on March 17th, 2023. Had to fit into Ben's busy schedule. Uh, hope you all enjoy the chats. We did. And yeah, talk to you later. Bye. So, uh, thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it. Been looking forward to talking to you for a long time. Right on. Um, <clears throat> I have like four basic things I want to cover. Okay. Uh, and then we could you could take it wherever you want from there, or or even it, within these, our show's really more conversational than peppering you with questions. You know, I sounds good to yeah, me. Yeah, we bring up a topic and then just kind of expand on that. So. Um, <clears throat> So welcome. It's a great honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Um, the four things I wanted to cover, I'll just start with the first one. I wanted to know about how you got into this area. What what prompted you to, to start looking into solar activity and space weather and, you know, where did it all start? Well, it's a long story, but I'll make it as short as I possibly can, I guess. <laughs> okay. Uh, I had a lot of lack of focus when I was younger. Um, I wanted to look at a bunch of different stuff. So I was studying both science and economics in undergrad. And um, I became quickly disenfranchised with both of them. And so when I graduated, I went to law school because I didn't know what else to do. Um, and then I became disenfranchised with law in the middle of law school, but I did still cross the finish line. Um, but when you have a law degree and you are disenfranchised with law, what do you do? Well, you're basically trained to be a research expert. Um, law school is one of the last places in the world that teaches you how to think as opposed to just regurgitate information. And so I went into due diligence for an, uh, an equity firm, a bunch of venture capitalists. Um, Which firm? Uh, Empire Advisors. Empire Advisors. They, uh, they're out of Columbus, and they're actually a really good group of guys, um, not like most multimillionaires. <laughs> uh, they were actually a pretty good group of guys. <laughs> um, but I also felt like there was more I could be doing, more I should be doing. And, um, you know, being trained as a research expert, one day I decided, you know what, I'd like to do what I do for these millionaires. But in terms of topics that I like, things I want to do research in, they had just launched the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And um, I was like, this is an amazing new way to look at the sun. I can't even believe this exists. I've always been interested in weather. I was a meteorology uh, minor at university before I got into a fight with uh, a fairly well-known climate <laughs> science professor. Uh, and so I was also interested in earthquakes. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do research on earthquakes, weather, and the sun, and we'll just talk about it, and it'll be fun. What I didn't know was that there was going to be all these connections between the things. And it became readily apparent that people who watch the sun don't watch the weather. People who watch earthquakes don't watch the sun. There's no crisscross there. 
Um, and while ultra specification uh, specialization has provided a number of great bits of innovation recently, we have lost that interdisciplinary renaissance type thinking where it's like you step back and you look at the big picture. You've got people, I mean, to actually publish in physics or science today, you have to have your head in the box. Like you don't have time to stick your head up and look around what everybody else is doing. And it became really clear that there were all these connections. And uh, at the same time, I was learning about Earth's changing magnetic field. And I pretty quickly, uh, pretty quickly decided that, okay, this is this is something nobody else is looking at. The people who are even close to looking at it have no interest in looking at the totality of the picture. Um, they are stuck in a paradigm where they're not even allowed to go outside of it. And I realized there's a really big need here for somebody to actually apply these kinds of skills to this kind of research. And uh, apparently the world agreed. Oh, most definitely. And and your point about the uh, the hyper-focus, not the specialization, really, uh, of science is really destroying that that landscape view, the, the terrain theory of of uh, science, uh, it's it's bad. I mean, especially in medicine, especially in allopathic medicine, I think it's oh, most yeah. apparent that. You yeah, know. and you know, I, I don't want to say we don't need specialization. No, that's absolutely. where some of that's where a lot of the great innovations, a lot of the great discoveries come from. The problem is once you've been driving down all these different specialization roads for so long, somebody needs to step back and look at the bigger picture and say, all right, what can we learn when we bring these things together? And that's what is lacking nowadays. It's almost like a complete loss of pattern recognition because you're so hyper-focused on one thing, you can't, just like you said, you can't see the, uh, where everything connects. Well, that's interesting. Um, yeah, what uh, SDO was very cool. I was very enamored with it when it first came out too. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's just it's mind-boggling. All right, cool. That's very cool. Uh, it's too bad about your law degree. I remember I had jury duty once, and I decided I'm going to be a lawyer. <laughs> what a mistake. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah, cool. I, uh, I had two bad experiences in law school that made me realize I never wanted to be a lawyer, but I didn't come to that conclusion until I was getting ready to start my final year of law school. Mm -hmm. um, so for any of any of your viewers who know anything about this, and you know, I'm sure there's probably at least one who's going to know what I'm talking about. Um, I was a pretty good writer uh, and did well enough my first year of law school that I actually got an internship with the Supreme Court of Ohio. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that the judges don't really do much. It's all the clerks who do all the work. Yep. It's yep. baseball season. Uh, it's the summer interns that do all the work. Uh, and at the end of the summer, there was a there was a decision that was handed down. And I remember looking at this decision, and I, so this was a couple weeks after I we had gone into the second year of law school. So I was already taking classes again, but I, I saw that the opinion had come out from the court. And I'm reading through it, and I found one word that was changed from what I submitted. And, I, and I'm realizing I basically wrote Ohio law after one year of law school. And I'm like, that's <laughs> cool, but that's also really, really wrong. Like, that <laughs> never happened. Um, I decided to get an internship with a more traditional firm after my second year of law school. And it was the kind of place where, I mean... <sighs> This law firm should have been named Swindle and Shyster LLP. <laughs> you answer an email, bill an hour. You answer a phone call, you bill an hour. The partners would leave every day at noon and go play golf. And they were somehow <laughs> billing 80, 90 hours a week. And I'm like, what is this? This is not, this is not right either. And so I'm, I go and I enter the third year of law school, your final year. And I'm like, I don't ever want to be a lawyer. <laughs> So I had to figure out something to do after I actually graduated with the law degree. I, I never took the bar, um, which I, I'm very glad about because I hear the Ohio bar exam is actually kind of a beast compared to other ones. Um, but I, I, I could never just do with chat GPT now. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> and you, you know, it just makes me think about all these people, these clerks and whatnot 
are writing the legislation that our Congress is passing, you know? Right. So right. it's the same idea. These, the, yeah. <laughs> you know where I was going with well, that. It's like, yeah. this in, it's like this in allopathy, too. A lot of times it's really the nurses that know more of what's going yeah. on, that do more of the hardcore work than the actual doctors. I, I absolutely believe that. I absolutely believe that. Uh, to the point you, you made a moment ago, we've gotten to the point where legislation that is passed is so wordy and so obtuse that it requires interpretation. Uh, you know, if you're just any guy, anybody looking at it, you're like, well, does this mean this? Does this mean this? Can I do this if I do this, this, and this? The courts end up interpreting it and basically decide what the law is rather than the legislators. So, absolutely. And, so and <clears throat> as a just an aside to that, that spurns all kinds of crazy conspiracy theories about what is really going on underneath, you know, like this whole admiralty law versus maritime law. Or I'm sure you've heard those arguments right. versus common law and all that, but that's all spurned by the unprecise language in these bills, I think. Yeah, it is. It absolutely is. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, you mentioned you brought up the climate, your, your feud with the climate scientist. Uh, I, too, am not a believer in this man-made climate change mythology that's being uh, bandied about by just about every mainstream media organization. Um, Cast over us like a wet blanket. Yeah, it's the, the next big thing after COVID. After the COVID yes, it certainly is. Yeah. And, uh, and CN, CNN's admitted that, that one Project Veritas interview the guy said, we're going to be rolling out climate change as the next big fear-mongering campaign after COVID, when COVID's over. And, I mean, the writing's been on the wall for years. <clears throat> Somebody put out, who was the video today I saw? I don't remember where I saw it, but there was a video on BitChute or, or YouTube about um, all the climate change fear-mongering over the last 50 years, you know, and how, or like <laughs> Al Gore, right? You know, ice caps can be melted by 2013, and they always... It's always in the future there's something going to be wrong. Anyway, it doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. Um, God, so, uh, solar catastrophes was my next subject. Uh, you, okay. You've uh, identified or confirmed these, these cycles happen, right? Where um, you've got the micronova, right? The micronova cycle. <clears throat> the... Um, the Great Flood is that's one of them, right? That's another solar catastrophe cycle. Uh, and right. You see, can you talk a little bit about that, how that works, you know, your view of, of all that? Sure. Um, so it's been long known that there is an 11-year sunspot cycle where every 11 years the sun has a peak of activity and a trough of activity. But they're really starting to understand now that there are even longer cycles of activity um, in terms of millennial scale, um, multi-millennial scale, and, you know, even higher. And what they are realizing is this is not just in terms of overall activity, but for when the sun releases something like a super flare or the solar micronova, um, they're still a little ways away from really wrapping their heads around the ladder. But the super flare science is now pretty solid. Um, this is no longer some pseudoscience fringe thing. Um, essentially, uh, it, it's matching up with major climate shift cycles that we know exist as well. And so about every 1,500 years, 1,500 years, there is something called a dansgaard Oshker event where there is a massive heating that takes place on the planet. And just to give your viewers a, a little bit of perspective, this is up to 16 degrees of warming in a decade or two. Compare that to what they call global warming now, which is one degree over the last 150 years. This is nothing. Um, and what we also know is about every 1500 years, there's a pretty powerful super flare on the sun uh, and Every four of those 1,500-year cycles, which adds up to 6,000 years, there's an extreme event in the climate where that heating actually goes too far and triggers a major cooling event. Um, 
And it just so happens that there's a 6,000 year super flare cycle that's even bigger as well. And these are the sorts of things that are starting to match up and that scientists are starting to recognize as they are now for the first time, really starting to look in an interdisciplinary uh, way. And the way this works, uh, in, especially in terms of the 6,000 year cycle, what happens is, is ice is accumulating at the polar regions because of the, the, the cold that exists at the North and South Pole we get a super flare that absolutely blasts the earth with energetic particles. And because of earth's magnetic field, those particles tend to be funneled to the North and the South pole. But when we get a super flare, this tends to rapidly melt the ice. And when that happens, you get basically one of earth's safety mechanisms kicking in. In this case, the melting ice due to heat puts cool, fresh water into the ocean. A lot of people don't realize that the temperature of the atmosphere is about 70 to 80% based on what the ocean temperature actually is. And so this cooler ocean starts to cool the atmosphere. While that is happening, you have cooler, fresher water. And because you know the, the ice that's melting doesn't have salt in it, so it's actually desalinating the water and you know there's a reason why they they put salt down on icy roads because salt melts ice well if it, if the water's cooler and less salty it's easier to freeze and so as the atmosphere is getting cooler one winter you get a super freeze of that circumpolar region and that starts to reflect sunlight um as opposed to having the sunlight absorbed into the ocean. And it's basically a runaway cooling event. Um, this is one of the ways that Earth basically protects itself. Whether you're talking about too much heating or too much cooling, the Earth has a way to kick it back in the other direction. Uh, just for a good example, if it gets too cold on the planet, you get a lot of freeze out of the vapor in the atmosphere, falls as snow all of a sudden, the amount of clouds on the planet drops significantly the clouds aren't reflecting sunlight more sunlight is coming in and it heats the world back up mm -hmm. so this, this notion that earth is going to run away in one direction either cold or hot it's just not the case earth has an amazing safety mechanism that basically if it finds itself going too much in one way it just kicks it back in the other direction and that's what happens every 6,000 years when we get that super flare that melts a ton of the ice at the polar regions. Interesting. And I, the same could be said for CO2, right? The ocean absorbs additional or excess CO2 from the atmosphere when it gets to a certain point. Not only the ocean, but uh, the plants do the plants, as well. Of course. There are there are tons of articles that that they they try to use when people started to say wait a minute if we have more plant food aren't the plants just going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger uh, <laughs> they tried to debunk it it didn't work so well the earth is actually greening I don't know if you've seen any of those articles recently but the earth is actually getting greener and greener and greener and greener uh, as time goes on because plants love their food and they love warmth so that's where we're heading and uh it's doing a pretty good job of actually mitigating the amount of co2 that's in the atmosphere and of course we're talking about 4%. a very tiny yeah. right yeah like 420 very, parts per million or something like that. it's really tiny yeah, it's it's, very very tiny yeah very tiny i know and then to, to the whole you know the alarmism around the rising co2 rates is just like ridiculous and when you try to explain it to the believers like my parents, <laughs> it's impossible. They're like, no, no, CNN says, you know, it's we're all going to die next year. Okay. Yeah, we got a world full of NPCs. We do. We like, but we no. also do have some major events coming around. So the thing that they're focusing on is not the, it's the sleight of hand that the talking mockingbird media is having them all look at. It, it reminds me a lot of what happened when Rome fell, when they were losing the war and it was clear that they were, that Rome was going to fall, that they just put on endless circuses for the people and shows. <laughs> yes. They basically just 
anything to stop the people from realizing what was actually happening was what they were doing. And that really feels like what we've got here again today. It's still successful. It's still a good strategy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Humans took, haven't changed that much. No, not at all. It makes me wonder if there is something coming that all of this is a, an attempt to obfuscate. You know, there's some... Like they know about some catastrophe that's on the way and this is all just trying to keep people calm, but they're not doing a good job of it because it's just waking well, people you know, up. There, well, there's ben. a natural catastrophe on the way, but then there's also the man-made disaster, which we are in the middle of right now. Yes. Uh, oh, And it's all connected. It's all connected. Which man-made uh, disaster? Which one? <laughs> there's so many. Um, there is an intentional uh demolition of the global economy there yes. is an intentional demolition of traditional values ethics family values mm -hmm. of just look at your t-shirt that's part of this agenda right there baby yep, yep. right that's, there that's another yeah just pur purposeful destruction yeah, so of people's health this was ab yep. this was absolutely a, a planned event they mm -hmm. want people to be fighting based on race they want people to be fighting based on political ideology they want husbands and wives fighting each other they want men and women at each other's throats yeah they want degeneracy they want to kill any kind of faith or spirituality that doesn't align with their woke ideology mm -hmm. and unfortunately this is this is how you this is how you take out a civilization. This is how you weaken a civilization. Um, it's unfortunate. But well, and, and and so, and as you talk about, and of course, I love your live streams when you're just like, watch, the, <laughs> you always constantly watch the threads, you know. Um, so with the event that could be coming up, the solar event that, as we move deeper into this cycle, and this has been a dynamic cycle. I mean, I have been so surprised at some of these flares going off. That one the other day from the backside was- yeah, that was cool. Oh my God, it was gorgeous, yeah. but imagine. So what are you thinking? I know this is, uh, this is kind of like magic eight ball moment, but what do you think the likelihood is that we will see some major activity here shortly, at least within the cycle, but it, there's something been that feels like with the bread and circus situation going on that there's, there's something that seems imminent here. And I don't know if it's just me feeling this way. Uh, I'm not a person given to fear. So it's, it does feel like we're, we're, we're right on the precipice of some major geological stuff that seems to be completely tied to the sun right um i i am constantly watching the solar activity um a lot of that has to do with how earth's magnetic field is doing um based on where we are right now i'm still quite hopeful that we'll make it through this sunspot cycle uh we may get some scares especially if something like the flare that happened last week on the far side of the sun were to happen. Um, but even still, I mean, I think that they've got a lot of things up their sleeve still to come. I think that um, our tests are just beginning as a species and as a planet. Um, it is remarkable how much a lot of this lines up with things that are found in scripture. Um, you know, I, I, rem I can remember I was 20 years old and I was agnostic moving towards atheist. And while I don't necessarily find myself aligning with any one religion that exists as it does today on the planet, I do know that my study from particle physics all the way up to cosmological physics of galaxies and beyond there are too many coincidences for me to believe that this realm is the result of randomness, chaos, gravity, and collisions over billions of years. Uh, there was some sort of design put in place. Yeah. And beyond that, as a man of science, as a man of math and statistics, I have to look at how much 
in the natural science world and in the cultural, social, political world that lines up with things from the Bible, the Quran, the ancient Indian stories. And when I say Indian, I mean, actually India, Sanskrit, not Native American. Yes. Um, and I'm it. like, so, okay, this is too many to be a coincidence. If I'm a man of math and I'm a man of science, we have statistically significant correlations here where it's like, you can't ignore this anymore. And so literally from a point of purely science, I have had to come and admit that this religious stuff is real to some degree, even if, you know, they didn't necessarily know the source of it. Um, what they say is going to happen. I mean, th they have descriptions of what's going to happen to society, what's going to happen to people, and what's going to happen to the earth and the sun. We see all of these things happening, and I can look down the line economically, socially, and from a physics perspective about what's going to happen to the earth and what I expect to happen to the sun. And I'm like, this is exactly what these stories are saying. And I also don't think it's a coincidence that as all of this is happening, they are trying to pull people away from that. Um, I am not a believer in the power of the devil, but these people sure are. <laughs> Whoever's in oh, yeah. charge, they sure are. Um, and it's <clears throat> that's a problem because they can make it real. Have you ever read? Well, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go on, Jer. No, I'm gonna... always the one taking up too much no, space. No, that's fine. Up in here. <laughs> I feel like I've been dominating. Um, have you read any David Icke stuff about the Sabbatean Frankists? I haven't read that. Um, I know that David Icke has a, a lot of different ideas about a lot of different things. He's also sent me several emails and shared some of my videos over the years. Um, so I know that he's at least got his eye in the right place sometimes. Um but what does he say in that one? I, I don't remember which book it was. Maybe The Trigger or one of those around that time because I interviewed him about four or five years ago. Uh, he That book was just coming out. And he was talking about the Sabbatean Frankists and how they were basically antithetical to everything that was mainstream. You know, they, they were degenerates. They were sexual deviants. They... They were all about cross-dressing and transgenderism and destroying everything that was good in the world. And like the Weimar right, Republic, really. Sort of. Uh, I just thought it was a real interesting theory. And over the last, since I've talked to him about that, it seems to be the way things are going. Not necess not saying that, necess that these people are necessarily uh, beholden to that to that belief system, but it's just the path of, of civilization seems to be going down that path. And some would even argue that um, this is the result of like the Jack Parsons Babylon working in 47 or 52, whenever the hell that was, you know what I'm saying? There's so many things yeah. that, that point. Eh, there's lots of conspiracy theories and it's really, you can't pinpoint anyone and say it's correct. It's just, I think this just might be the natural evolution of civilization. That's possible, um, but that natural evolution has come to a point where very powerful people are pushing it forward a lot. Correct. Whether you're looking at Grammys, the Super Bowl halftime show. I don't know if you heard about the latest geoengineering efforts they have. It's literally called the Satan Balloon, the <laughs> oh stratosphere aerosol transport <laughs> and uh, nucleation balloon. So it literally stands for Satan Balloon. Um, like the Lucifer telescope. Exactly. Um, and, In your faces. Yeah. The, this next one's tough because I am a believer that regardless of who you are, who you love, who you think, who you feel like you are inside, you have basic human rights. Um, you should be able to marry and love whoever you want. But at the same time, I can't deny that all of these texts say, the rise of certain things are symbolic of the end. I can't deny the fact that the, you know, one of the main evil characters outside of the devil is Baphomet, which is a trans goat. Um, and so I, I have a conflict because 
as as individual to individual goes, they're human beings and they should have rights and they shouldn't necessarily like they shouldn't be bullied or ostracized or anything like that. But I also have to realize what it means on a bigger level. Um, so what, you know, as far as Baphomet goes, that was uh, Levi created that like in the 1800s, I thought it didn't exist before then. Yeah. Um, but it's still it it doesn't matter actually when it got created and the idea of it. I it well, that it became very much pushed into pop culture, into the zeitgeist, which is what most people right. feed from. And then, of course, they feed from it and then they feed into it. I'm wondering, actually, on this subject, if what you see so i'm i'm wondering about the nature the spiritual nature of space and it's always been interesting to me that the, our sun the sun s o n s u n that there's this connection here and to me that's always been a very spiritual connection there's a reason why it is named that what are your thoughts on this kind of theological aspect of this dynamic in our in our cosmos you know the uh the english language is full of stuff like that and it's hard to take a look at any example and come to concrete proof or conclusions but there's so much of that where this funny wordplay seems to give you all the hints that you need just as everything is thrown in our faces it's not hidden at all um it makes you wonder about the creation of this language in terms of the timing of it um, and what it all actually means. There's, there's probably something to it there. I know that there have been guiding hands on civilization for a long period of time. And it's hard to know whether those were guiding in the right direction, the wrong direction, or just a necessary direction. You know, as much as I, I hate a lot of the things that are happening, I have to ask myself, is this necessary? Um, you know, did did we as a species advance to a point where we need to be tested in a different kind of way? Did we need to, um, you know, check our humility versus pride uh, status a little bit? Do we need something other than scientific and survival tests do we need moral tests to actually separate what we should be doing in terms of going forward versus what we shouldn't be doing going forward it's and there's a large school of thought out there that this this push that you describe is to awaken consciousness in the public you know it's <laughs> I've always said that the universe will slap you in the face until you wake up. And it, 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 at some point, things just become so banal that they, their people ignore it, you know? So it's got to get more and more radical over time in order for you, for, for majority of people to notice it. I don't know if that's true, but it just seems that way to me. Maybe when you're my yeah. age, you'll see that. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I have hope that, that there's the possibility of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm a big believer that nothing good in this world comes easily or cheap. Yeah. That everything worthwhile, really worthwhile, takes a fight in order to get it. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Cool. Maybe, maybe so, we're doing that right now. Maybe. So with this... I just want to make sure I get, I get satisfied here. Satisfied. This, uh, this idea of, so, right, the language and the, I guess the intentional fuckery of it all. The sun seems really obvious. The sun, the, the, the universe has this idea, the connotation. We could break down the constellations, but as far as the nature of space, Ben. And this is your wheelhouse. What do you think the actual nature of it is? And so we're looking at it from, from a view that, well, 
I don't even want to see that any further. What is the nature of space? And I want to kind of look at it in a theological way outside of the, say, the physics of it. There's some, there seems to be something to me when I interact with whatever that is on a spiritual level, I get a, it, it is, it's so vast that it's actually hard to take in, but it feels very much, I know this is high woo, but I get a sentience feeling from it. I get a sense of God with it all. Yeah, and it, it, it's hard to conceptualize something like that, but let's even go as far as we can down that line where this is some kind of great hologram it's like a testing ground or even, you know, even something beyond that. Um, if that is the case, then we're here for a reason. And um, it is designed to make us think a certain way, to test us in certain ways, either to have us learn things or to see what we will do. And therefore to operate within the confines of that construct to the best of our ability is everyone's duty. Even if we can recognize, I mean, even if we could learn tomorrow that, Hey, there is something outside of this, you know, there's another dimension we all go to when we die, or we're all hooked up to some computer and living a hologram right now. It doesn't change the impetus for what we should all be doing. Um, because we're here for a specific purpose to try to do the best we can. We, you know, our, our intuition and our concepts of good versus bad, they're there for a reason. Um, it's, it's hard to really, um, apart from having the very interesting thought experiment of it all, it's hard to know if it's, if it's, something we should be using to guide our decisions or do anything differently than what we know we should be doing in our hearts anyway. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get to a point where we can have a definitive answer about that. Um, but, but the, the way I put it to somebody who, you know, I, I have some friends who are convinced that we are in a hologram. And then the moment they get across the stage of of you know wondering about whether or not any of this stuff matters or how real it is i like to actually give them a little slap upside the head and be like all right we're in a hologram did that hurt <laughs> you know, so so what's the difference like you're here now and you're here for a reason and we're not going to break this paradigm um and you know th there's also the possibility that those things that give the hint of sentience to the universe as a whole is part of the design of it. Yeah. That it knows that it needs to follow the same rules for a proton here, a proton on Jupiter, a proton in a galaxy far away. It knows that the basics of math and natural laws have to remain constant. Um, It's kind of like this. I have friends who who still don't understand that you can believe in creation and evolution. Yeah. I don't I have no idea why you can't believe in both. Like if you believe in creation, what you, did God create things so then he would have to go toy with every little atom and everything over time? Boy, what an insult to that engineer. <laughs> why why would a great engineer just set things in motion with processes that develop as time goes on? Um, set things up to have a certain math, to have a certain nature, to be able to learn, to be able to evolve and change. Um, Sounds like algorithms. Exactly. <laughs> it, it really does. But at the same time, it's it, it, it brings me back to the notion of what do you do about that? Do you spend all your time sitting there contemplating it? I don't know. It's fun to do for a little bit, but at the end of the day, even if you come into the affirmative of the sentience, the hologram, the what do you do differently on a day-to-day -day basis? You should still be out there trying to be the best version of yourself, get a little bit better every day, trying to do good and not trying to do bad, not trying to hurt people, trying to help yourself, the people you love, and to the extent you're able, help as many people as possible. Um 
It's like the flat earth argument. It's like, even if it's true, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, well, the flat earth might I, be another story. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, this is... the, the, the point's still valid. Regardless right. of the shape of the earth, there's nothing you could do about it, and it's not going to change your life in any way. So why even go down that path? But what I'm hearing being said here is this, to me, the way I'm interpreting this is that this is actually sentience and self-sentience with uh, what do I do? This is a this is all that kind of being responsibility, the, the internal mechanism of responsibility within your own psyche and your actions that play out in the world, the causality of you in your space around you and how it affects everything else is at play. And of course we can throw a religious um, template over that, but this to me does seem like a calling towards self sentient, self awakening, self being within this greater uh, idiom that we're in. Yeah. It's hard to deny that. Before we too stray too far from what you're talking about, the holographic nature of reality or that idea. Um, I heard a really interesting interview last night with, um, this person who I used to follow, but not so much anymore because she's really deep into the aliens are here kind of narrative, which I don't know if I believe or not. But uh, anyway, one of the things she said last in this this interview, and I'll, I'll send you the link if you want to listen to it, it's only an hour, was that regardless, regardless if this is or is not a holographic projection or some kind of container, uh, the fact that our bodies are locked in this frequency setting, right? That we operate in a certain frequency level, that matter is real to us. But other beings are in a different frequency level. They can seem to pass through like walls, right? So I thought that was a really interesting perspective, one I hadn't thought of before, that, that their, their energetics don't work the same way our energetics work here in this realm. And that's how they could possibly do the things that the people describe them doing. You know, that's a tough one. That. It, it sounds really good. The problem is, you know, for those who work with frequencies, especially things that generate different frequencies, there are no frequencies that are hidden from us. Like we have everything from zero to the ultra high frequency, this or that. Um, we can do this with light. We can do it with sound, mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of uh, other vibrations. And I almost feel like there might be a way to describe this, but when we just talk in terms of frequency, it gives, it might give people the wrong impression because I think we have to, there has to be some other way to describe it because the, in terms of frequency and vibration, um, we've got all of that at our fingertips in terms of science right now and we can't go through walls we can't make a ball go through walls right. we can't make anything go through walls right uh, regardless of what frequency we resonate or what kind of vibration we put into something um it's it's not impossible but it's something beyond the oversimplification of just saying it's a different frequency um, I think she which, is, which is unfortunately where a lot of these folks lose a lot of scientific minds because there could be something real to it, but then they're just like, no, like they're on a different frequency. And it's like, oh, hey, you started with something that might be real. And then you showed that you don't have any idea what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, from a perspective. So they actually end up losing their way. And then from there, they just go into woo woo topic after woo woo topic that could have some basis in reality but it's because they derail from where um the, the, the actual point of explaining what's happening um yeah and i absolutely agree with that you're i yeah you, that was well what, said. so we're in the tesla kind of land so what what do you feel about that the ether field and um you know i mean these this is what he was talking about as far um, as frequency, vibration, and energy. 
Yeah, but he also didn't talk a whole lot about aliens coming through walls and stuff. Right. Well, that's a that's that's like cult of chicken and all that. And so <laughs> <laughs> the blue chicken. Cult. I'm not, I'm not pulling up to any of that either. Yeah, but I, I I did want to ask you about your feelings towards Tesla. Um, way about way before his time, um, still in context of the time in which he lived, you know. If you've done any research about 5G or even 4G or electromagnetic yes. energy, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is pretty dangerous mm -hmm. for us. Now yes. imagine that Tesla had got his way. Let's imagine that everybody had listened to Tesla and every ounce of electricity humans have ever used didn't go through copper wires, but they went through the air and went through our bodies and through our cells. We might all be dead right now. Tesla got his way. He may have killed the entire human race. That's and, something that's something people don't think about a whole lot. Right. Um, and in fact, the uh, his wireless electricity system, there w it wouldn't be able to generate the amount of electricity we need today to run the world. No. Yeah, there's nowhere near um, it. And it, it would go out in all directions. So much of it would be lost. Yep. Uh, you can't direct it as well uh some of his i think some of tesla's most important work was obviously you know in the ac versus dc current realm and also if any of you have ever seen him sitting like this yeah, next the, to that bolts. oil yeah. um the idea that some of these frequencies are good for our body and some are bad for our body um, like if anybody has heard about like frequency healing, whether that's through electromagnetic waves or sound vibration, um, I think Tesla had a lot to offer in that realm for sure. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like I said, he was a genius. He was well ahead of his time, but we also have to look at that in context of what was known in the world at that time, because he was still operating in a world that was based on the rules that he knew. Um We've discovered a lot since Tesla that he didn't know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. And, you know, thankfully so. And th that we continue to trudge forward with uh, people that trailblaze. And you've definitely been one of these people. We've all, anyone that's followed you has watched some of your battles with some of these stogies. <laughs> <laughs> but I, so also the idea of moving, uh, so I think for me, some of the stuff with Tesla that seemed really interesting was the idea of moving what appears to be, and we know that things aren't completely solid, but using vibration and using this type of uh, energy to move things, elevate things through magnetics and uh, the possibility that that could answer some of these age old questions people have had about past technology and all that it's it's you know I, I it's an open table for me i'm not a scientist and i definitely don't try to pretend to be one so it's all interesting to me the ether field is something that i do find of interest as well and sometimes for me when i think about tesla and the offerings he brought it takes me deeper into i guess and this is the woo a, a spiritual space that actually opens up ideas within my head that lead me back to there was something intelligently done here. No, I mean, I, I, I think that there's something to that. Um, electric fields um, are, they can overcome gravity fairly easily. Um, it's just knowing how to manipulate them in the right ways. Um, back before Dr. Kong Papu Yen went home to Thailand, he was, he was levitating things on his computer desk. Um, I went to his house in Washington once and I saw, I saw him do it. It was pretty incredible. Um, most of the patents for the, what are basically plasma UFO technology that the Navy has. Yes. They're, they're based on electric fields and other things like that. Um, two towns of brown. Yeah, I think that Victor Schauberger knew a lot about this stuff. Um, Do you follow Ken Wheeler made... at all? Every once in a while, it's hard to listen to that guy. <laughs> <from being. laughs> 
he's got some really interesting perspectives on electricity and whatnot. But yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it's all right. He talks about uh, Steinberg or, or Steinmetz, actually. Yeah. Wrong person. Yeah, Steinmetz. Yeah. Um, people online, when they're referencing those things, I've noticed they tend to talk about it like it's just common knowledge and it's easy stuff. Mm-hmm. And yet nobody's out there like levitating stuff. Right. Um, <laughs> it, this is one of the things when you start to get into this and you realize that there's probably some truth into this and people have done amazing things in the past. Almost everybody, when they get into it, it's it becomes such a, an important thing in their heads that they talk about it with such certainty and oftentimes authority. And it's like, okay. Show me. <laughs> <laughs> what, ben, what do you think disagree. about the D wave, Jordy Rose, and all of that? So, quantum computing at the level at which they are, um, you know, coming forward and proposing this whole this whole dynamic in our field now. It seems sometimes in contrast to a lot of other stuff, and I get my myself. I get confused in the minutia of it all. I remember when the folks who were into that D wave stuff were saying, "Look, this is what all the quantum data and all the messages say is going to happen. The world is going to end on December twenty first, twenty twelve." I've been I've been, I've been listening to this for a while. Um, I. I am now permanently in a show me state. Uh, <laughs> I am permanently suspicious of all claims that are even remotely like this. Um, They've yet to actually create a quantum computer that's actually usable. Like I know. Yeah, I mean, they're it's theoretical at this point, kind of like black holes, but you know. Yeah, and it is still based in a reality that is that has its foundations and things that I know are wrong. Mm-hmm. Like you know, the um, standard model of physics? Like the standard <laughs> model of physics, where gravity comes from, yep. um, the true nature of what an atom is and what subatomic particles are. Yeah, they, they have some really, really cool ideas. But at some point, if you look down into the foundations and there's cracks or there's impurities, it's going to affect the whole and <laughs> turtles all the way down isn't it yeah. <laughs> what about so what about the whole thing that dyson brought forward the dyson sphere and all that in terms of what that was quite yeah. the expansive yes well i so i, I basically i just want <laughs> well because i'm just open i'm just trying to learn and so what are your ideas on that there's you know it's getting a lot more traction lately there's a lot of theoretical stuff about whole ideas of civilizations within a dyson sphere and um i don't know on on paper that's for sure but does it work on paper when you've seen it some of it does and some of it doesn't it's it's sort of like they they make it work, it, but they'll say things like, okay, we've got it here, this works, presuming that there is this level of energy usage and there is this much energy production from the star inside. And it is, they have found a way to create these kinds of alloys, which we haven't discovered yet, but they would have the, this property and this property and this property and this property, and they would be resistant to heat and thermoelectric and superconductive, but also insulative. And it's like, okay, well, that's a lot of ifs. And like when you (laughs) make all of those ifs, you could say, yes, we found a way to make the math work. But it's like, does something like that actually, is it actually possible in the universe? Um, You know, it's, it's like the same thing when they talk about dark matter. Yes. When, when, when they say, oh, we have made the math work where the particles could be this size and have these characteristics and also interact in the in this range right here. The problem is nothing can be talked about with authority until you have until you're down to only one variable. Yeah. And so with dark matter, they don't know its size. They don't know its charge. They don't know its interaction profile with what we call normal matter. So no matter what they find, 
they can move the bar here and say, ah, see, it still works because we're going to move the other bar here. Right. And when you have more than one variable, you can say almost anything and say the math works. Mm -hmm. But the problem is it doesn't it doesn't mean in any way, shape or form you're operating within physical reality. Right. It's but, still the land of theory. Right. Our Which whole, a lot uh, of our reality yeah, is based upon. Just going to say that was just going to say that. A ton of astronomy is based on that. A ton of it, yeah. an unbelievable amount of it, actually. Almost all of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's real interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you about earthquakes because I've always had this. Uh, or sorry, two things. You you brought up earthquakes before. Are there any earthquake, quote unquote, predictors you? follow or pull up to their theories like no you ever you ever watch dutch census stuff about the plate movements and all that no okay well that's not actually that's not actually his stuff is it okay. um no um like everything from the whole hey these deep earthquakes precede earthquakes at the crust that was that was all clouded blot discovered by actually members of our group and uh while we call them blot echoes mm -hmm. to give give credit to clouded blot from several decades ago, he just tells everybody he invented it. Um, there was a guy who, uh, his name was Scott. He went by the uh, online name Hook Echo. He noticed the pattern about earthquakes on one side of the Pacific, then followed on the other side of the Pacific, and then after he um, after he unfortunately passed. Dutch started using that and saying it was his own. Um, I, I used to do a lot of earthquake forecasting stuff, but mainstream science is catching up to it now. Yeah. And I'm pretty confident in their being able to take it forward. They're now monitoring everything from geomagnetism, chemical, uh, you know, ionized chemical releases, total electron content in the atmosphere before earthquakes, and they've come a long way. There's now entire textbooks on pre-earthquake phenomena. Um, the only thing that they aren't quite as good at yet is using the sun. Mm. Um, but that's going to come too. They, this is one that they're actually going to get. Yeah, and they'll have to. In order to make their theories work, I think eventually it'll have to be factored in. Right. Which brings me to my next thing which i wanted to just cover real quick was uh the magnetic excursion on the pole flip sure. uh, stuff you've talked about quite a bit um i know the magnetic excursion on the north pole is accelerating right towards the westish in the west eastish direction rather uh, um north and the south are accelerating oh uh -huh. south, okay i did not know about south the South actually uh, began speeding up the last couple of years as well. Um, they're on a collision course, actually, which is a very strange thing. That is weird. It's like we're going from a dipole magnet into a bar into a horseshoe magnet. Are they converging um, towards the uh, the anomaly, the South Atlantic anomaly? No, no. away from that. Away from converging that. towards the Bay of Bengal, which actually is the explanation for the South Atlantic anomaly. Oh, yeah. You know, they, they want to say it's things happening at the core mantle boundary. No, it's not. No, it's not. The further away you get from a magnet, the less, the less effect it has. Right. Well, the North Pole is moving across the Arctic Ocean towards Siberia. The South Magnetic Pole has left Antarctica and is moving up towards the Indian Ocean. If you take a look at where they're set to meet in the Indian Ocean, meaning the area from which they are getting, you know, they're getting further and further away from is the South Atlantic anomaly. So yeah, the magnetic field is weaker there hmm. uh, because that the poles are moving directly away from that area. It, it couldn't be any simpler. And they, they always want to give a ridiculous explanation for why it exists, but yeah, the, the poles are shifting the magnetic field of the planet overall is weakening. This is the major major problem we have coming up in the next few years maybe at most two decades or so uh, because this leaves us more vulnerable to the sun mm -hmm. every time this has happened in the past species have gone extinct there's been terrible climate change there's been radiation spikes um, massive tectonic and volcanic activity it's the great disaster on a twelve thousand year scale and uh it's about to happen again 
Cool. That uh, description you just gave was so good for me looking at it in the, and I guess the horseshoe classical magnet from cartoons almost. Right. Yeah. And I, I could just see this. This was part of a seesaw session yesterday. That was gold for me. Uh, just while we're here, and Jerry, not to usurp you, I just wanted to make sure we covered the idea of how the sun and all the and the the pole shifting is affecting people psycho psychologically and emotionally. And because physically. Ben, Ben, are you noticing the uptick in crazy people? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It, it, there, there's two main effects that this has. Um, one, the extra electric, the extra electrical activity, and the extra cosmic ray bombardment that we have in the atmosphere due to the weakening magnetic field. These do two things: it directly impacts the hippocampus processes, which means it's degrading our ability to have high cognitive prowess. It's making us dumber. Two, it is having a profound effect on the locus ceruleus, which is a tiny little thing deep in deep inside there but it's the panic fear anxiety center where they all converge and are mediated um see our complex part of the r complex the what complex the reptilian brain um i think it's a little bit outside of that but it, okay. it's certainly related to it, highly connected to it but essentially what we have is lower cognitive function higher propensity for terror panic anxiety, fear, leading to more emotional instability, which feeds back into our lack of cognition. And that lack of cognition feeds back into the fear and the panic and the terror and the anxiety, which feeds into emotional instability. And this is a this is cycle. one of the vicious, vicious cycle. And everything from the stupidity to the degeneracy to the lack of morals to the terrible decision-making that people are having – it's all connected to this and it's very it's very easy to understand is there a way that that so if we're talking about this slow demolition or this slow takedown uh over of the realm of whatever the fuck the shadow hand is of these people that seem to be um controlling a lot of the the uh tearing of the fabric of our society is there a way to control or direct solar activity towards certain regions or to say magnify these effects that we're talking about right now into the field? No, and they don't have to. They just have to take advantage of the disaster, which means knowing what people are going to be more susceptible to, knowing what the propensities are going to be, putting certain things on the news, putting certain things in front of your face, putting certain things on the radio emitting certain frequencies throughout the earth. So um, there's no way to direct the effect. They can only um, take advantage of it and do things to make us more vulnerable to it, including destroy our diets and our nutrition. Yes. Uh, and the hormones. <laughs> yep. And fluoride. So. Well, um, no carry on. Sorry. No, oh, it's it's they, they can't toy with the earth or the sun like that, but they can toy with us. They certainly can. So uh, I had one more thing about the magnetic stuff. And <clears throat> it's this thought occurred to me several years ago after listening to you that uh, perhaps our magnetic pole flip is driven by a coupling of the magnetics between the sun and the earth that the, the sun cycles actually cause the poles to flip here. And it's not really anything that's earth, earth generated. Is that crazy talk? Um, Is that an idea? I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's galactic. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen the sun go up and down every 11 years. Uh, it doesn't seem to have any effect whatsoever on us. Um, but and now you know, we're we're we're, we're, we're the Earth is in the part of the sine wave where it's going through the galactic sheet, right? The galactic, correct. Uh, current. Okay, so it could be that that's causing it, or maybe it's. I'm almost certain. I'm almost certain that's what it is. Okay. Okay. Literally going from the north to the south galactic magnetic field right mm. now, and um, that that's having a pretty profound effect, not just on the Earth but the entire solar, solar system. system. You're right. 
Right, right. Yeah. The, yeah, I've seen the the anomalies being reported. You know, oh look, this and yeah, totally see that. Cool. Can well, you? I, I've got. I want to get this last question. I have. Go ahead. It I'm, isn't it, so radiation. Radiation's a big deal, and what I'm noticing, Ben, is sometimes with a lot of people's sicknesses or just different variant radioactive. I don't know radioactive. Radio radiation sickness seems to be something I'm noticing. And I don't know if I'm just in the woo too much. Uh, can you break down radiation from the solar experience onto the plane here in, in earth on earth on this realm? Um, you know, uh, it, it comes in a couple of different forms. A lot of it doesn't even come from the sun. It comes from galactic cosmic rays. Um, but what, what might be more important is to note that the people who are taking the most effects right now, the people who are most vulnerable, are the people who, frankly, their diet sucks. Their yeah. physical body sucks. Yeah. Their mental health sucks. Their amount of unhealed trauma that they have is enormous they take a negative look on things you know they, they've done studies about people who think positively and people who think negatively it creates a different electric field around your body and it just so happens thinking negatively makes you a lot more susceptible not having the proper nutrients in your diet makes you more susceptible not having a strong body or a strong mind makes you more susceptible having more unhealed traumas makes you more susceptible and yeah. so this is this is one of the key separators right now people need to be doing everything that they can to be the best versions of themselves and be positive it's it's going to be the number one decider as things move forward who who loses it who gets sick um, who's most vulnerable to the programming or the enhanced effects of radiation or other EMF frequencies, things like that. It is incumbent upon everybody. Like I, I, I tell my folks all the time, guys, stop drinking, stop doing drugs, bros, stop watching porn, <laughs> get, in, get yes. in the gym you know, figure out your, your toxic behaviors that hurt you in an, in everyday life. Take a moment, step back, figure out what internal securities are driving these behaviors, and then take another step back and figure out what traumas you have deep down that are causing those insecurities. Mm. And then take a positive aspect on everything. Anybody who is not coming together in the high, in their highest form of self on every single one of those planes I just mentioned to use the word that I've learned over the last hour that you seem to like, they're completely fucked. <laughs> Seriously, if you're eating like garbage, if you're doing drugs, you're drinking all the time, you're fucked. Yeah. Bros, if you're watching porn on a weekly basis, you are fucked. If you take a negative stance on everything, you are fucked. You need to have an internal locus of control. If you think, oh, I'm unlucky, or uh, I would do this, but this happened to me. No, no, you control everything. And if you don't believe that, you're fucked. Go work <laughs> out in some some way, shape, or form. If you're anywhere near my age or my health level, get in the gym, or you're fucked. Yep. I the love amount, that you... The amount yeah. of stuff people need to be doing right now to not be fucked, almost nobody has an understanding of how much they need to be doing for themselves right now because this is this is the time it's going to be too late very soon i i wholeheartedly agree with I all of too. that and you're one of the few people i hear out here saying that so a lot of people will agree with everything you say but then they'll be like dude the porn <laughs> I, I need I to know. beat off what am i <laughs> it's, so that's that's, that's cheap Cheap dopamine hits aren't going to help you. Losing touch with reality isn't going to help you. <laughs> and uh, on top of that, for men, semen retention is a life hack. It is. It, it is a life hack. Um, it's in some of the spiritual. I mean, it's in. It's out there as oh, yeah. as as old 
old um, wisdom for men well, and also for women. You know, there's an interesting thing. They've done studies on this, even though the difference between masturbating and having actual sex with somebody, there are, you know, there are some aspects of the finish line that are exactly the same, but masturbating reduces one's testosterone and actually having sex with someone you love it increases, increases the man's yeah. testosterone. They don't exactly know why, but there's something there. <laughs> there's something, there's something to be learned in that. Um, so, you know, so, I've had a vasectomy, so I retain all my sperm. There you go, buddy. There you go. I just as a woman, uh, I have noticed the difference in men. I can tell. It's almost like I can smell it on a man. The difference. It, it, it also, I want to say, I notice it in men that don't masturbate, that retain it and uh, use it, I guess, I don't want to say this appropriately, but maybe as it, it should be, uh, there's a a different level of control all over their lives. And all one needs to do is look into someone's life. You don't need to hear what they're telling. You can look and see, you can see. And just like the old Chinese uh, masters, they can look at you and see what you're, you, they don't need to hear your words. And so I've encountered this with men that, um, that retain, that retain that uh, idea and men that are chronic masturbators and there's a way different energy field. And I've definitely always been attracted to those that have that kind of internal power. And, and I'm willing to bet a bunch of your viewers are like, what the fuck happened these last five minutes of this show? <laughs> no, no, this is typical fare for us. And this is audio. But this is important. We do auto audio only, by the way. Really? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. We want people to so focus all on hand, the... all those hand gestures I was doing earlier in the show. Nobody was like, <laughs> no. Even... And your and your awesome shirt also. I'm, I'm not even recording <laughs> the Zoom. I apologize. Yeah, I thought I I thought I had told you it was audio only. Yeah. You may have, but uh we like I, people I to focus on the conversation versus having the gesticulation be a distraction. But still, the point here of relevance is that this is a martial arts idea of retaining your energy. And one of the easiest ways for men, especially for men, is to get that under wraps. And it shows. Uh, it, it's, it's, a vir it's a virility that shows. You can pick it up. I can almost smell it. I hate to say that. It sounds kind of crazy, but I can, I can, I can sense this in men that, that do masturbate and, um, and then there's the ones that are crazy that are masturbating all the time. There's the <laughs> casual ones, but the men that don't and, or also men that seem to be in good relationships, it shows, it literally shows there's, they're not going to give you the time of day. I, I, I have. I feel like I've gone into a state of in the world we're in today. I feel like I sound like a Luddite sometimes. And I'm of course for all sexual beings, but I, what has happened? It's worse than ever. It, it is. It's just absolutely a, a weird playground out there. It's cartoonish. We've got, and of course with the trans agenda and uh, you know, this is, separate from real trans people, which are rare, rarely happen. The agenda of this neutralizing everyone into this one kind of soy blob is interesting and noticeable for someone like me who has paid attention over the years to these different dietary fads and all this, what looks to me like what people describe as gray aliens is actually happening to the human race in front of us. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately it's fueled by attention seeking behavior um, and the, the hormone dysregulation that people are getting and the promotion that they're seeing in music videos and on television, these people's brains are literally being hijacked their their lymphatic systems are literally being hijacked um and their blood chemistry is literally being hijacked and sadly the vaccine's part of that too oh yeah 
Yeah. yeah well, absolutely. that that's all, that all the vaccine is such a funny thing because it is it tells you where people were psychologically. It tells you where they are. It just told it. It was a litmus test, and it so it. It told everyone what you needed to know about other people and how they function under pressure and peer pressure. And then, of course, there's how many billions were spent. This was a world event um, as to see how humans would get on. And I, frankly, have been disappointed with humans over this last three years at how much they will lay down and take it at how how easily they have proven to be herded. Yeah, um, it's like we didn't learn anything from the blind <laughs> compliance of Nazi Germany all those decades ago. We forgot history and we repeated it, uh, which is really unfortunate. And it's a, and talk about science. I mean, you can the proofs in the pudding here. <laughs> you can literally look around and look back and see this cycle. So I don't know how long we had with you, but I. I did find my way into lots of stuff and I did want to get into hormones with you <laughs> and you got there. I just had one more thing to bring up and then I was going to let him go. Sure. I uh, wanted you to be able to talk about the ranch. Oh, um, promote it or discuss it or whatever you want to say about it. Talk about it. Yeah. Uh, Observer ranch is something that we are building in call, uh, just outside of Colorado Springs. Um, it's going to be a place that observers can come together and, uh, you know, hang out with each other. I mean, for people who are awake to a lot of these things, the world is seeming to be very uh, isolating. Um, a lot of people can't talk to their friends. A lot of people can't talk to their families about these things. Every time we bring like-minded people together who are into this stuff, it feels like the best kind of family reunion. And, um, it's great to be building something like that where um, that can be fostered and continued on a permanent basis. Um, in terms of promoting anything, I guess really the only thing I'd want to promote is the YouTube channel because that's sort of the nexus for everything. All of our websites, our publications, the ranch, uh, and various other things as well. Um, the YouTube channel, Suspicious Observers, that's where it all where it all happens on a daily basis and that like i said is the nexus for all the other things that come from it okay and there will be links for all that in the show notes when i publish this awesome, awesome. And... well this was a great pleasure ben after yeah, all these you. years i've i'm a longtime fan yeah, and love the trajectory of how you made something start from nothing and and grew everything to this point it's very impressive and stood up against a lot of the stogies in the scientific community stood your ground and the receipts have come in they're coming in and you are still standing triumphant so rock on brother right on thank you very much for having me on anytime you're always welcome back and we could dig into any one of those topics for two hours you know i this was kind of like a <laughs> quick hour let's cover as much as we can so we we'll really appreciate Absolutely. it appreciate it thank you so much and uh hope, thank you guys hope, talk to you again take care all right bye, bye, -bye guys